Um, the literary and cultural stories get, give a cordial welcome to all those present for attending our first formal event of the year. As many of you already know, our working group focuses on the professional development of literature postgraduate students in the Department of Spanish and Portuguese. We graciously um, thank our statement being for accept, as, accepting our uh, we invitation to share his work in the academia, the academy, and for his amability with us all in coordinating this event. Thank you so much. Um, now my fellow group member, Chaglar Erteber, will talk more about the agenda for this event. Thank you, Romy. So the event will be divided into sections. In the first part section, I mean, each part approximately 30 minutes, and Dr. Duran introduces his two academic works. After Dr. Duran's presentation in the second section, uh, <clears throat> my fellow uh, will manage a Q&A session, and we will start with the article titled Humanities Accused Jobs, the Tactics of Controlling Entrepreneurial Humanists. The Dean uh, is a co-writer of this article with Dr. Ken Al McAllister, and that will be published this coming summer in both the ADE Bulletin and in the ADFL Bulletin. It's based on the concepts of entrepreneurial humanities and entrepreneurial humanists and how Dr. Duran has developed and applied them uh, as Dean of the UNA, uh, UA College of Humanities. The second article is about Brazilian French literature and it's based on his research interests and publications in Brazilian studies. And Dr. Duran defines and discusses the concepts of Brazilian French literature works of fictional or non-fictional literature written by written in French, by French or Francophone authors after they were directly influenced by a sojourn in Brazil uh, by Brazilian works and culture. And I give the floor again to my fellow Romy Seron, uh, Romy Seron and she will introduce our guest speaker, our dear Dean Aline Philippe Duran. Thanks. Okay. Thank you, Chaglar. Um, okay, I will to introduce to, to Dean Philippe Duram. Um, Alain Philippe Duram is Doran's Dean of the College of, of Humanities, Professor of French, and affiliated faculty in African, African Studies, Latin American Studies, LGBT Studies, and Public and Applied Humanities at the University of Arizona. His research interests include French and Brazilian literatures and cultures, French cinema, and high pop studies, and the promotion of the humanities disciplines in the profession. He is the author and editor of five books, including his more recent volume published in 2020 by Roman Litliff, um, High Pop in, on French, an exploration of high pop culture in the Francophone world. Um, he has published many chapters and articles in his scholarly journals, such as PMLA, The French Review, Romance Notes, Contemporary French Civilization, Letras Raras, and Romance Quarterly, among others. He is associate editor of the journal Contemporary French Civilization, The French Government Award, Award, Award during the Palms Academic, um, etc. The University of Arizona, our Durham, the five star faculty, um, the Richard Ruiz Diversity Leadership Faculty Award, and the African American Community Council Distinguished Faculty Award. Thank you, Dr. Durham, for being here with us today. Thank you very much. Muchas gracias y buenas tardes a todos. Uh, yo sé que es parte de la de, esta, de este evento de, de, de hablar un poco de español uh, al principio y voy a tratar solo un poco porque uh, cuando hablo español ahora uh, si, si empiezo a hablar uh, rápidamente uh, voy a hablar lo que se, lo que se llama portañol 
porque, <risos> porque agora falo muito mais uh, português uh, que espanhol e cada vez que, que trato de, de falar em espanhol uh, em velocidade normal, e o português uh, domina. Por isso, uh, queria realmente uh, agradecer uh, este grupo Uh, por toda esta iniciativa e, e mais que todo a la, la invitação uh, para, para falar com vocês uh, hoje e especialmente uh, quero agradecer uh, Romi Yanaí Seron Canche e Jorge Manzanilla Pérez que me mandaram a la, la invitação, uh, a convida. Então, <risos> não mais de, de português ou de espanhol agora. Vou mudar o fr... não, o francês não, é inglês, em inglês. Uh, so thanks again for being here, all of you. Uh, uh, and uh, what I'm going to do then, based on uh, you know the the uh, the series, I, I have attended some before, and I, I really like that format. Uh, some of you or most of you, I think, have received the uh, the, the the documents the, that. Uh, were published or that I'm working on. And what I was trying to do was to find some that would be in connection, of course, with this group. So this idea of uh, uh, Brazilian French literature, which is something that uh, is of big uh, interest to me. And uh, Romy, when uh, she contacted me, they asked me to, to, to talk also about uh, in my role as Dean. So I thought that this forthcoming uh, article that I did with uh, the associate Dean Ken McAllister would be appropriate. So. If that's okay, what I'm going to do, I, I will actually uh, start with the, the Brazilian uh, French literature piece. Uh, and, and so since you have had that, uh, uh, I have some work in progress on that. You have had some uh, past uh, publication, but what I'm gonna do is to give a, a brief presentation on, on a few things that interest me and, and where uh, and, and why really there is such a thing uh, in my opinion as a, as Brazilian French literature, he, he come from way back. So I'm going to try to see if it works for me to share my screen. Uh, and uh, ah, so it's telling me that the, uh, I cannot do that. Us disabled participants screen sharing. So let's see. Uh, can you give me like permission to do that? Maybe. If not, if if that doesn't work, what I could do is to. Um, email it to you maybe, uh, and uh, let's see here. Yeah, when I click on uh, share screen, it says uh, us disabled uh, participant screen sharing. One moment, Dr. Duran. No problem, no problem. Okay. Dr. Duran, participants. Sorry for the Okay, now yeah. it is. Yeah, it just came up co us, so that should work. Thank you so much. Uh, let's see. Ta -da. Can you see that? Okay, so, all right. Can you all hear me still? Okay. All right, so just a brief, uh, a brief overview uh, about, uh, you know, why uh, there is this connection between, uh, between France and Brazil and, and ultimately uh, literature and, and culture uh, of, uh, of France and, and Brazil. It's because, you know, there are some historic reasons that go uh, way back. So I have, a, I have a chronology here about really the, the presence and interaction of uh, France <clears throat> and the people of France with uh, with, uh, with Brazil, or what uh, became uh, eventually uh, Brazil. And uh, I will go up to uh, the foundation of the University of Sao Paulo, uh, USP in, in Brazil, which is a very important uh, event actually in this context and this topic of uh, 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 Brazilian French literature. Uh, so the, the, first, um, uh, the first thing uh, that, uh, that is important uh, to, um, uh, to take a look at is that uh, there is there is some argument that uh, uh, the word itself of uh, uh, Brazil uh, or, or Brazil in in French uh, there there are some arguments out there that says that uh, 
uh, maybe where the French who suggested that name. So there, there is some arguments between the, uh, uh, the Portuguese and the, and the, and the French that uh, it referred to the wood, to a type of wood, the Pau Brasil, that, uh, that was uh, really uh, valuable uh, in commerce uh, back then and that ended up being, that the country uh, ended up being uh, uh, named uh, after. But uh, really, when things are really starting uh, between France and, uh, and Brazil is with this idea of the, of the France Antarctic. Uh, and uh, this is a first attempt of setting up a, a colony uh, in, on the land of what is known today as, uh, uh, as, uh, as Brazil. Uh, in, the, in the 16th century, in 1555, uh, there is a, a French explorer uh, of the name of uh, Nicolas Durand, but he's not related as far as I know to my family, uh, but Nicolas Durand de Ville Guignon uh, was the, you know, came with an expedition in the area, the Bay of Guanabara, which is now where Rio de Janeiro or close to where region, Rio de Janeiro is located. Uh, and they established a colony there, which was called uh, Fort Coligny uh, and referred to as the France Artant. Artant Antarctic. And, uh, uh, you know, uh, pretty quickly, they, they, they enslaved uh, the, the local population that were, that were there, the, the Tupinamba people, uh, who suffered uh, great mortality uh, after being exposed to this, uh, uh, to this invasion uh, of, the, of the French. And so there is this text uh, that, that you see here by Jean de Léry. It's a very famous, uh, very famous text. It's a travel account uh, of that expedition. So Jean de Léry uh, was somebody who was part of, the, of this attempt of the French settlement. And he wrote this, uh, this text, which is really known as a, as a classic now, uh, Histoire d'un voyage fait en la terre du Brésil. It's from 1580. Uh, history of a voyage in the land of, uh, of, uh, of Brazil. And the reason why I mentioned this, uh, this text is because uh, it's in discussion with another very famous text that was published many years later uh, by the famous uh, French anthropologist, uh, Claude Lévi-Strauss. Uh, it is a text named uh, Triste Tropique. Uh, that's a text from 1955, but it's based on uh, the stay of Claude Lévi-Strauss uh, in Brazil uh, in the uh, earlier part of the 20th century. Uh, and uh, he spent some time, uh, you know, in, in Brazil studying and living with some of the indigenous uh, population. And uh, he was also part of the foundation of the University of Sao Paulo, which I will come up to in a, in a moment. And those two texts, they, they kind of like respond to each other because, uh, uh, Levi Strauss, he talks about uh, the, you know, he has this kind of, he, he refers to the text of, uh, of Jean de Léry, but, uh, but in different uh, approach. So Léry is somebody like part of that colonial approach, right? He was saying, he was saying this, uh, 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 this, uh, this new land, this arrival as a, as a benediction, right? Whereas Levi Strauss, on the other hand, he has this nostalgia and melancholia where he sees, you know, the beginning of the worst of what's going to really uh, happen and is already happening by doing that with the civilization, supposed so-called civilization that is being imposed uh, on those population and is really destroying uh, a, 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 a culture. Uh, so, but, but those are two very famous texts in France. Uh, based on, on Brazil that a lot of people are, are familiar with, especially uh, in, uh, in, in academia. And so it's also this tradition that we see, you know, uh, uh, with uh, those texts of uh, French, uh, uh, French travelers or intellectuals uh, going to Brazil for different reasons and writing some text and some type of account about it from some like academic uh, uh, people like Claude Lévi-Strauss to some just like, you know, uh, uh, business, uh, business owners or other uh, uh, artists, uh, other people, but who always will be kind of relating uh, back home uh, what, is, what is it that they have seen. And, and of course, you know, uh, depicting a certain image uh, of what they see and, and what, they, uh, what they interpret. So uh, another, uh, another concept uh, of that is this uh, uh, this period? Wait a minute. Yeah, 
Okay, it jumped, he went too fast. There was another side before the one with the artist. Okay, so that's the, the concept of the, uh, the France equinoxial, which is another, but I think there is a problem with my slides here. Here we go. Sorry about that. He went a little too fast. Uh, I, this is what I wanted to show uh, first after this one. So you can see here, you know, this is the map, of course, of, uh, of Brazil. Uh, the France Antarctic that I was just talking about with uh, Jean de Lery, that's the area of, uh, of uh, Rio de Janeiro, which is around here, right? And then uh, the, 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 the other territory where the French got involved a little bit later, and that would, would be referred to as the France Equinoxial, was this area here where you have the San Luis de Maranhão, and then the territory that today uh, is known as, uh, as French Guiana. So I just wanted to show that map because uh, as you can see to this day, you know, technically there is a common border uh, between uh, France and, and Brazil because of the, uh, the, the, the French Guiana department uh, that is located there. Uh, so the, the France Equinoxial, that was another attempt of, of the French, you know, uh, in the 17th century in that case. And uh, you see a picture here of the city of uh, San Luis du Maranhão, which is in the northeast uh, part of, uh, of Brazil. And, 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 and same thing, you know, it's an attempt of the French uh, to colonize this area, to be present that will eventually be uh, unsuccessful because they will be kicked out uh, from there. Uh, but, but this is another uh, area where the French you know, got, uh, got involved in, in, a, in addition to the, the French Guiana, which uh, I have uh, already mentioned. So way back from 15th century uh, and on, 16th century, 17th century, you have had those, uh, this presence, uh, this colonial uh, presence of the French uh, uh, in Brazil in many different uh, attempts. That's what I want to, uh, to underline here. And so, one thing that is going to happen uh, in, the, in the 19th century, fast forwarding a, a little bit, is that um, uh, there is going to be a French expedition, not ex a French mission, artistic mission that is going to be invited to come to Brazil uh, to train uh, artists in Brazil. Because this is a period where, you know, in literature and culture even, there is this idea about uh, uh, France in particular, but also Portugal or England, like in Europe, you know, that it's supposed to, if you are from like a rich, uh, a rich family, you are supposed to be uh, uh, educated with those precepts and those uh, perceptions that will come from, uh, from Europe. So there is this kind of voyage initiatic of the rich families where they will send uh, the son uh, to go study for, you know, for a couple of years at the university uh, in Europe somewhere. Um, possibly in France, and then and then come back, and then the, what they're going to do is they're going to bring uh, several artists from France uh, to to train uh, or to uh, uh, you know teach uh, what uh, the the form of art uh, that was seen at the time as the the, the type of uh, artistic expression that we wanted to, uh, uh, to to follow, and that's something in itself very interesting. I'm not gonna spent some too much time on that, but I just wanted to mention it as this habit and this, this, um, this idea of, you know, bringing people from France uh, to, to, to kind of do some, some, some training uh, and, and, and uh, in, initiation to different, uh, different arts, uh, different subjects as we're gonna see as well, starting with the fine arts here. So you have an example from a, a painting by Jean-Baptiste Debray, uh, and then, I'm also mentioning this because in terms of art, the Brazil was really, uh, you know, interesting, interested in the French uh, uh, artists and sculptors and, and writers. And the most famous uh, emblematic uh, image of, uh, one of the most famous emblematic image of Brazil is this statue that you see in Rio de Janeiro uh, that is called the Cristo Redentor uh, on the mount called the Corcovado. And the, 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 the artist, the sculptor who, who did that work is French. His name is Paul, Paul Landowski. And it was a, a work that was commissioned uh, to, the, to the French to, uh, to, to do. And you have the, the picture here. Here is another one that is, uh, that is very famous, of course, is the postcard, uh, the famous postcard of, uh, uh, of, uh, of Rio de Janeiro. Uh, Another uh, connection with France and Brazil, and one person I want to mention uh, really quickly is this guy here, Michel Chevalier. 
uh, the reason I am uh, I am mentioning him is because uh, he was is the man who is often associated with the creation of the term uh, Latin America uh, or Amérique Latine uh, in French uh, in the mid uh, uh, well it's around 1834 uh, in the 19th uh, century and uh, there he, he, Michel Chevalier he was a he was a, a French economist. Uh, but he, he, he came up with this theory of the, of the pan-Latin ideas or, or pan-Latin America. And uh, he, was sent, uh, he was sent on a mission to the United States and to Mexico uh, on behalf of the, uh, the Minister of the Interior of France at the time. So this is in 1834. And when he visited the, uh, this area, he, he, he came up with this idea of uh, how the Spanish speaking and Portuguese Portuguese speaking parts of the Americas, according to him, uh, share the cultural uh, or, or uh, affinity with all the European people with the Romance culture. Uh, so, you know, France, uh, Spain, Portugal, Italy. Uh, and so, so Chevalier, um, he came up with this idea uh, that uh, of a like the same way that we could have maybe like a, there is a, a Latin Europe, you know, in the southern part of, uh, of, of Europe, as opposed to the what you will see as the uh, areas of Europe uh, closer to uh, Anglo-Saxon America, you know, or, or Slavic Europe or uh, Teutonic, Teutonic Europe in the north, that they were, he, he, has this, he had this theory that the southern part of Europe had this, this uh, culture in common uh, with those Spanish speaking and Portuguese uh, speaking countries of the Americas. And, and, and that's how he, he came up with this idea of a Latin America and the Latin uh, 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 Europe. So something interesting about, uh, about that. Uh, and then, uh, of course, uh, if you don't know this already, uh, the, this is the Brazilian flag. And as you can see on the flag, it says Orden e Progresso, which means uh, order and progress. And this comes directly from uh, the theories of a French uh, sociologist, Auguste Comte, who was very uh, liked and famous uh, in, in Brazil in particular in the 19th century. And uh, you know, he, he, he was a sociologist, but he came up with this concept, this theory of positivism. Uh, and this is something that was very popular uh, at the time in Brazil to the point that, you know, they, they put uh, order and progress on their flag. Uh, and, and so positivism is something that uh, uh, Kant has, has described as the, uh, the invariant laws of the natural and social world. And he identified it with three uh, basic methods uh, for discovering this, uh, what he called the invariant laws. Uh, and so in his theory, it's based on one observation, two experimentation, and three comparisons. So this kind of like almost scientific approach uh, uh, of things through the, the positivism and the importance also of the modern, uh, of the, the, the progress, the modern things, the new technologies, uh, um, those kind of things. So just quickly, what I, this, the reason I wanted to do all of that is to show you that you know, there is this long history, often problematic history between the two countries and uh, what I see as a, some kind of a culmination, especially for the topic of today, is the, this picture that you see here. As you can see, uh, all guys, all white males, uh, no, <laughs> no women on this picture. Uh, this is a picture that was taken uh, at the, the first year of the founding of the University of Sao Paulo in Brazil. And those, it's a picture of the professors that were brought in by Brazil uh, to help start the University of Sao Paulo. And all the professors, uh, they, most of them, if not all of them, they came from France, Portugal, uh, Germany, Italy, and, uh, and England. And the idea was like, you know, for engineering and topics like that, uh, we're gonna bring uh, um, German professors. Uh, the French, they were brought in for social sciences and the humanities. Uh, so you had like all the, and, and the, the, men, the, the professor I mentioned earlier, uh, the famous anthropologist, uh, Claude Lévi-Strauss, he, he was one of the, he was one of them. They were like young uh, uh, professor at the start of their career uh, in Europe uh, who were sent, uh, you know, uh, to help start what would become the University of uh, Sao Paulo. 
And, and the reason why this is very, uh, this is very important uh, in this context is because what's gonna happen is that some of these professors, they're really gonna be get interested in Brazil and in Brazilian cultures, Brazilian authors. So they're not just gonna come and teach their courses. They're gonna get some curiosity about what's going on. And, and one of them is this guy that you see, uh, there are very few pictures of him. That's the only one I could find. His name is Michel Berveillet. He was a professor of literature who was brought from France to help found the University of Sao Paulo. And uh, he, he read that book, uh, that novel by a, a young Brazilian novelist named Jorge Amado, uh, who would end up later being one of the most famous uh, uh, Brazilian novelists in the history. Uh, and he, 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 he read his, uh, his novel from 1935 called uh, Jubiaba, uh, which was, uh, uh, which Bervelier with his, another colleague of his, Pierre Orcade, translated. They took the initiative to translate it into French uh, and send it to France. And that, that ended up being published uh, eventually in France. Uh, and that's how, you know, the career really of Georges Amado ended up starting uh, in France because of that, uh, that connection of publishing that, uh, that book. And, and that, so here he is, that's Jorge Amado with the, the cover of the, the, the novel I'm talking about, uh, Shubiaba. But another thing that, uh, that was very interesting about this is that, sorry, there's some problem with my, here we go, is that the, the man you see on this picture, the famous French no, uh, author and winner of the Nobel Prize, uh, Albert Camus, uh, he was a very young, not known, uh, uh, the, he was not the Albert Camus that everybody uh, know and that would became famous at the time. Uh, and he was uh, working for this uh, newspaper called Alger Republicain. And he was uh, writing book reviews uh, for that journal. And he was the one who wrote uh, a text about uh, a, a book review about uh, that, uh, that uh, novel uh, by Amado, which plays a really big part in uh, eventually uh, making him uh, known. And this is something that I address in the text that I have sent you. So I'm, I'm not gonna spend too much uh, time on that. But what I, want, what I want to make clear and emphasize is that it was really with all these people from the University of Sao Paulo that when things got started with people like Claude Lévi-Strauss, with Michel Bervelier, with this guy that you see here, his name was um, um, Roger Bastide. He was a professor uh, as well at the University of Sao Paulo. And he got really interested in the African religions of Brazil and especially uh, the, 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 uh, the, the religion of Candomblé. And he wrote a lot of books that were about uh, these uh, uh, cultures and religion that were published in French uh, and, and that people were discovering in France for the first time. You know, it's, the, the, this is because of people like that, like uh, Bastide and Lévi-Strauss and Amado, that they, they were starting to be this interest uh, and this information uh, for Brazil. And so many people uh, followed into their steps, okay? Um, Makunaima, that's a, that's a very important work from Brazil by uh, Mario de Andrade. Uh, he was one of the leaders of the movement known as uh, Modernism. And uh, uh, Roger Bassid was really uh, interested in, in, uh, in Makunaima, especially in that book, because Andrade was trying to propose an alternative uh, a text that would be really focusing on the Brazilian identity itself. And, and he was arguing that Brazilian identity, it's not a European uh, identity. It's not something that we have to copy, uh, you know, when it comes to art and to literature and to those things, we don't have to take it from, uh, from Europe. We have that in ourselves. We have our own land uh, of, of Brazil and we can, uh, we can write about this ourselves. And so he was really a proponent uh, of this idea, and Makunaima is a very interesting uh, text. If you get a if you get a chance to uh, uh, to to read it, I'm keeping an eye on the time, so that's why I don't want to uh, spend too much time on those things. Just giving an overview. But uh, other people very important that were also that thanks to the text of Roger Bastide, thanks to the novel of Jorge Amado, that got curious about Brazil, were Jean Paul Sartre and and Simone de Beauvoir. You see pictures of them here in 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 Brazil. And you see here a picture of them with Jorge Amado, the Brazilian author I was talking about that became friends with, with Sartre and Beauvoir because Jorge Amado spent some time in France in exile, in political exile, because he was 
uh, a communist uh, writer, and uh, uh, he spent uh, uh, he had to exile from Brazil, uh, and he went to live in France, and that's when he met uh, and and started uh, collaborating and becoming friends with uh, Jean-Paul Sartre and, and Simone de Beauvoir, uh, who were eventually invited to Brazil uh, by Amado uh, to uh, visit uh, the country in 1959. And of course, what did they do about it? They, they, they published uh, uh, stories and accounts uh, uh, about it. So there, there are some famous, uh, sorry, there is a problem here. It, it jumped some, some of my slides, sorry about that. So Simone de Beauvoir, for instance, the famous uh, uh, French author, and one of the rare women, women uh, uh, writing in this case uh, in, on those topics is, uh, uh, you know, this is one of our most famous book. You know, uh, Beauvoir, she's really known for her memoirs. She wrote a, lot, a long series of very famous memoirs in France. And one is called Our Times, The Forces of Circumstance. And there is an entire account in that book uh, about the trip that she took in uh, in Brazil with uh, uh, Jean-Paul Sartre uh, and uh, Jorge Amado. And the reason I mentioned those again is because people in France, you know, who follow, those are very famous authors, people like Jean-Paul Sartre, Simone de Beauvoir, uh, Roger Bastide, uh, Claude Lévi-Strauss, you know, those are, those are famous professors, famous authors. So when they, they publish those texts back in, at home in France, people read them. A lot of people read them and, and they will discover Brazil in many cases through their eyes. Or, or, the, or then Jorge Amado, oh, okay, there is that Jorge Amado is a friend of Sartre and Beauvoir, let's check him out. You know, let's, uh, let's see what he, what he writes about. And so that's how you have this, it generates this exchange with people wanting to know more about it, right? Taking some trip, Albert Camus, you know, he made a trip to Brazil as well to go uh, see what was going on and to try to meet with some of these, uh, uh, some of these writers. And, and in the other direction, it was the same thing with Jorge Amado. Jorge Amado uh, really spent a lot of time in France, he even lived there part of the year for, uh, for, several, uh, for several years. And you can see him on, uh, on French television here where he was really uh, a big... Uh, uh, superstars. This is like in 1980 or 1981. And his books, you know, all of his books uh, have been translated into French. Uh, Spanish and French are the, un the only two languages that uh, where the integrality of his works were uh, translated. And, and so that's important too, because you have a whole generation of writers in France or people who will be eventually become writers who were influenced not only by those other texts I was talking about earlier by those French people, but by somebody like Jorge Amado from Brazil. And, and that can be problematic in some ways because of course, you know, you get like one version uh, of the, you know, if you have never been there and all you know is what you are reading for this, from this text, it can, it, can, it can portray a certain idea of Brazil or the country that, that maybe others uh, may disagree with or may think is, a, is different, all right? So that's, <clears throat> What's going to happen, and I'm getting now to, I'm going fast, but uh, we can talk more in the questions and answers. That's where we are getting to this idea of the Brazilian French literature. And so you have a whole series of French novelists that I'm very interested in. Most of them, they start publishing in the, uh, those books that really touch on that uh, is toward the, the end of the 20th century, but early 20th, 21st century. So the years 2000 mainly. And you have a whole series of novels, very often by men, uh, main authors, as you can, you can see there, who will write novels that will take place in Brazil. So those, those guys like here, for instance, is Patrick Grenville. He's not, he doesn't have Brazilian origins. He doesn't have uh, you know, connection necessarily to Brazil. But he got curious about it again because of this, uh, all of these exchanges throughout history and those texts. He decided to go visit, <clears throat> excuse me. And then when he come back, he writes a, he writes a novel uh, uh, about it. And you, you, this, uh, there are many examples. I am only mentioning a few, but I, I usually put their picture as well because you can see that there is this kind of similar image of like the, you know, the, the cool guy uh, writing uh, and, and, you know, so uh, right before that was Brazil Red, uh, which is about actually, it's a romance, uh, not romance, but it's a, a fictionalized uh, uh, story based on the, that uh, first colony of, uh, of the French in Brazil that I told you about uh, with uh, Villa Gagnon. 
uh, or then you have um, you have here um, uh, Jean-Paul Delfino, <clears throat> uh, Corcovado, which take place in, so he has a whole series of books. Corcovado is the first one uh, that takes place in, uh, in Brazil. Uh, Jean-Marie Blas de Roblas, this one is really good. I recommend it if you get a chance to read it. And it has been translated into English, Where Tigers Are at Home. Uh, or, um, um, Hold on, I, uh, Sébastien Lapac is another one, La Convergence des Alizés. Many of these books, by the way, except for the Brazil Red and the one, this one, they have not been translated into English. Here is another one by uh, Jean-Christophe Ruffin uh, called La Salamandre. And there, there are several others, but the, the, here is the definition that I propose, and it's always kind of the same. Can you, can you see that, or the, is the thing over the definition? Okay, good. So this idea of... Uh, uh, Work, works of, of fictional or non-fictional literatures written in French by French or Francophone authors after they were directly influenced by a sojourn in Brazil and by Brazilian works and culture. Uh, this literature whose action unfolds in Brazil highlights a demand for exoticism. These works tend to present ethnographic questions to picturesque, often stereotypical images of Braz Brazilian culture that foreground its culinary tradition, so there are a lot of like images that always kind of come back, you know, like the food, uh, the drinks, like cachaça and caipirinha, uh, the, the alcohol, is the cachaça, the, the carnaval, of course, uh, the, 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 the festive uh, atmosphere with the music, the different type of, of music, uh, the, the soccer, um, you know, drugs, and, and also this... Uh, uh, um, uh, the Macumba ceremony is typical of the religion uh, known as Candomblé. And that's something that is, uh, that is really interesting uh, to me, actually, because that's one thing that we see, um, that we see in all of these, uh, in, in all of these uh, novels, uh, not just the novels, in fact, even in the, the nonfiction. And that's, what, that's part of a, a project that I've been thinking about for a while and that, that I'm paying attention to, is that if you go the whole way back to the, 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 the novel I mentioned by Jorge Amado, uh, this one here, Jubiaba from 1935, one of the very famous chapters in that novel is called, uh, is called Macumba. It's a, it's, a, it's a whole chapter that is a scene of a Macumba, it, which, is a, which is a ceremony uh, in the religion of, of, of Candomblé that is very uh, popular and known, in, especially in the state of Bahia which is in the northeast of Brazil, where Jorge Amado was from, was from. And what's very interesting is that in all of those books that I have mentioned to you, except maybe for the one that takes place in the, uh, in the 16th uh, century, uh, uh, the fictional work that tried to, to, to depict uh, the, the colony of the 16th century, but all the other ones, you know, regardless if they are nonfiction or fiction, they always have a chapter about the Macumba. So uh, if you take, for instance, uh, uh, Jean-Paul Sartre, Jean -Paul Sartre and, uh, and uh, Simone de Beauvoir, when they went to Brazil, Albert Camus, when he went to Brazil, if you read their accounts about the trip, uh, Roger Bastide, when he talked about, about uh, his experience, there is always a depiction of, uh, of the, 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 that ceremony. Same thing in those novels uh, as well in the, it's like, it's like almost a rite de passage, you know, that if you're gonna be writing uh, uh, a novel uh, with uh, uh, touching on Brazil in that case that you, you, you know, it's almost like uh, you must have, you must have that, uh, uh, that scene. And so that's, that's one thing that is uh, really interesting to me that, uh, uh, that I'm interested in, in, in the project. I mean, there are, I'll, be, I'll be happy to talk more about this. I, I, I think there are many reasons for that, but, but that's, that's really typical of, of that. Another thing that we see is, uh, uh, and I kind of briefly touch on this, is a, a, a stereotypical uh, image uh, of, of, of Brazil. Like, like, you know, if Brazilian people, sometimes they will be reading some of those texts, not all of them will agree uh, saying that uh, it depicts well, uh, you know, uh, their country or their, or their region. In fact, Jorge Amado himself uh, used to be criticized uh, by people in Brazil, saying that on the one hand, you know, people will say, well, thanks to Jorge Amado, Brazil is known all over the world and people know about Brazilian literature because uh, you if, if it was not for him, they wouldn't. 
But then other people were saying, yeah, that may be true, but the kind of image of Brazil that they get from Giorgio Amado is not one that, that I, I concur with or that I think uh, should be uh, 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 celebrated. Like for instance, a lot of people will say that they, 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 they had a problem with Giorgio Amado often uh, sometimes uh, being criticized for being like a, a mis misogynist or to, or to pre present like, a, you know, an image of, of Brazil that, that is not uh, really uh, uh, serious or, or uh, you know, that people will say, well, you know, Brazil is not just about the partying or the, about, uh, you know, uh, the, 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 the uh, you know, eating uh, mukeka, uh, the, the special food, there is a lot more at, at stake. And, and according to some of those people, you know, uh, Amado was not doing a good job at, uh, at, at, at giving that, uh, that idea. But on the other hand, he was really, uh, you know, in some of his books, in most of his books, he was already and, and often associated as a writer of the people. And he was really always talking about, you know, uh, uh, the lower classes of society, uh, uh, topics as social justice and defending uh, the, the poor, especially uh, in, his, in the state of Bahia. So a, a controversial, somewhat controversial uh, uh, author, uh, not, not liked by, by all. So here I, I'm I have just put like the, the chronology uh, of some of the things that I, I have talked about, but you can see that throughout the years, especially in the 20th century, you know, it's a constant, uh, a constant uh, connection uh, between the uh, between the two countries that that keep going and and all of these texts that you see here you know the initial text they, they are the ones that are going to feed eventually uh, the a lot of the works from the people that gonna come later and that gonna write fictional uh, fictional works about um, about uh, Brazil so this is the this is the first part you know uh, about uh, the Brazilian French literature, I know I went, uh, I went quite fast, but I know you had those other texts. And like I said, I'd be happy to talk uh, more about in details in the, in the Q&A. We are almost at, uh, at 45 minutes here, I'm sorry, but I'll just say a few things about the second part, uh, which I, I want to make sure I talk about and, and, and I'll be happy to talk more uh, in the, in the Q&A. This idea about uh, uh, contrarian entrepreneurial uh, humanist, uh, this is a topic that is very dear to me, and, and, and what it comes to is this, I'm sure that all of you here, you have had to deal with that. You know, maybe you have had to convince your family or your parents to let you study the humanities, or maybe your friends or your relatives, they have said, what are you going to do with that? You know, like what a Spanish major, or like a French major, or you, you will never get a job with that kind of thing. You know, you, you should study business. You should study, uh, uh, you know, engineering or mm -hmm. you should study law. And so if we are in our, mm -hmm. in our world, and for those of you who are going to become uh, members of the academia and professors mm -hmm. in the humanities, this is definitely something that you're going you're gonna to be facing. Uh, this idea, you know, it, when we are in the humanities, we always have to justify uh, why we are important and why we should be at the table. All right. So if I if I go, you know, if there is like a, if there is like a, a it's career day at the local high school and they invite some uh, professors or some deans from the local university to come talk to the students, you know, if I go over there as the dean of the humanities. When, they when everybody introduced themselves, you know, my colleagues who is the Dean of Medicine, the Dean of Engineering, the Dean of Business, they, they just have to say that and people, you know, nobody is gonna say, uh, mm -hmm. well, what is that? What do you do with that, you know? But then when you say, I mean, you know, this is the Dean of the Humanities, this is people, some people, they don't even know what that is, right? So what, what, what I will say really quickly here is that in this article of usually that, you may have read is like the idea is to try to come up and to, to, to promote those tactics that make us, because we know what we do, we know that it's important and that the skills that we teach in the humanities, they are very important in whatever you do. Like for instance, you know, you cannot be an engineer if you don't have the skills that we teach in the humanities. You know, if you don't know how to think critically, if you don't know uh, how to have empathy, uh, adaptability, uh, communications, communicate, you, you cannot do those jobs, right? But our role and our difficulty sometimes uh, when we are professors in, in the humanities is that we have to translate that for the general public, right? So, so if, you, if you explain to somebody, uh, you know, 
Well, yeah, that's why we are important is because we teach something like critical thinking. You know, people will say, well, why should I study Brazilian literature? You know, what, what that's going to bring me? Okay, I'm going to know a lot about Jorge Amado, then what? You know, but, but it's not just it, right? You're not just learning about uh, Jorge Amado when you read uh, Jorge Amado. You know, you practice all these other skills that I was talking about. You practice on how to think. You practice on how to deal with different perspectives. You practice with how to deal with different people to see uh, and to navigate uh, differences. And those things, uh, they are very important uh, in, in, in whatever, uh, whatever one's do. But, but the argument you know, that we present is to use the taxes that are, that are used in, uh, in entrepreneurship, for instance. Uh, and I'll come back to this picture in a minute. So I'm using this uh, uh, reference, uh, Stephen B. Semple, he used to be the president of USC. And somebody recommended that book to me. And when I was reading it and I saw this, uh, you know, those men, uh, those men uh, rules of uh, what he called entrepreneurial humanist, uh, I, I really like that because I think that those skills, uh, you know, uh, they are very important, uh, uh, you know, uh, in our professions and as a blueprint of what we should be doing. Things like, for instance, you know, uh, humanity, we should not be staying in our lane. Why should we? We just like anybody else, we can be innovative and we can, uh, we can uh, go outside of the field. You know, it's not because I am in the humanities that I should only uh, stay in there. Okay. And this idea about creativity and to try to think outside of the box uh, is, is very important as well as, well as to uh, uh, collaborate and, and, and work with, uh, uh, with, with different people and, and, and interdisciplinary collaboration to me, I think is very important. And that's why I put this picture uh, before. Uh, I, I doubt anybody, sorry, anybody will know what that is. This is a picture of a very small university in Kansas called the uh, Emporia State University. That's where I studied. That's where I got my, uh, my undergraduate degree coming from France. Uh, I came as an international student and, and uh, that's where I got my, my degrees. And I studied, um, <clears throat> I studied Spanish uh, and, uh, and French there, uh, literature, but I also studied business. And back then, you know, uh, I, had to, I had to fight and convince my advisor to let me do that. Because back then, you know, it, people were like, why would you, you know, you, you either do one or the other. You know, this idea that you could, uh, and, and, and to me, you know, it goes way back. Because when, you know, way back when I was in college, I, I could see that right away that the, it's very important to have those skills that we teach in the humanities world for the business world and, and the other way around. And, and very often I would see, for instance, in my business class, when we would have to do like a group project or something, very often I would be, the, you know, that you have to select one, we're gonna report for the group or we're gonna write the summary of the group. I would always, you know, sometimes, often that would be me, right? Because I had those skills from the, from the humanities. But then when I was in my, in my Spanish class and we had to write the term paper and all that, I had all these organizational techniques, you know, that I learned from my, uh, from my business class. But anyway, you fast forward this many years later, that's why I put this picture here. It's like from way back then, I, I always thought, you know, it's very important that we have this interdisciplinary, this collaboration. If you are in the humanities, you are not just out there on the, on the island. We, we are really uh, at the center of things. And, and those skills that we have, we have to make sure that they are applied everywhere, everywhere else, including uh, for, frankly, I mean, for a, a better world. You know, some of those things that like uh, we work here at the university with the, the College of Medicine. And one of the things that they are really interested in is uh, to be more human. You know, you hear things like that. Really, this idea coming from the humanities is like when you talk to a patient, when you talk to people who are sick, you know, the, the, you have to you have to care about them. You have to really there is a way to talk to them. There is a way how you're going to be saying things. Right. And so that's where we can really we can really learn from each other. So this, this article, this idea is really to try to, to provide some ideas and techniques on how to do that, why it's important to do that, and really to try to convince moving down the road uh, those different colleges, those different disciplines 
that it's in their best interest to work with us in the humanities. But us as humanists, it's very important for us to, to take control of, the, of our own message, of our own advocacy. We cannot be counting on those people to figure it out. We have to translate it in their own language so that they can understand. Like, you know, when I was a student and maybe it was the same for some of you, just by taking those classes, you know, I knew that. I could see that he was helping me. You know, I, I was like, I was not saying, you know, why do I have to read the uh, Cortazar and Borges, uh, you know, in the Spanish literature class? You know, I could see what I was getting for that. Nowadays, it's not sufficient anymore. You know, to the general public, we cannot just say, trust me, come take my literature class and you'll see. 20 years from now, you'll, you'll be thanking me for that. We cannot do that. We have to put it into their words. We have to say, look, that's what you, what, that's what, that's why it's important that you take this literature class because these are the things that you're gonna be, uh, those skills that you're gonna be learning and that's how they apply. And then nobody can say, I, no, I don't see, I don't see that. You know, I always say, uh, and I will end on that. I always say, you know, if you go out there and you talk to the, to the employers, people from any company, you know, in the, in the country or in the world that will be hiring people for their own company in business, let be it uh, Procter and Gamble or, you know, AT&T, some company like that. And you ask them, you say, okay, what is your, uh, what are you looking for when you hire people, you know? And what they say every time is the things we do in the humanities. You know, none of these people, if you go and you tell them, uh, yeah, you know, um, how about I have a, uh, you know, we have some people here, they are trained and they are very good at critical thinking. They are very good at uh, intercultural competence and diversity. They are very good at communication, either in writing or in uh, orally. They can talk to any audience, anytime, small, big. None of these people, they're gonna tell you, ah, yeah, you know, that's nice, but we don't need people like that. Why, why, would I, why would I hire somebody who can do all of that? That's useless to me. It's nobody is gonna say that, right? But if you tell them, if instead of saying that you say, uh, I have somebody who can speak French, you know, most likely that's what they're going to tell you. They say, well, why would, I, I'm not in France. My business is not in France. Why would I need somebody like that, right? So, so you see what I'm saying? That's what, that's what unfortunately, you know, it, it's like this. Uh, the, okay, one more thing. You know, at the university, when you create a new program, a new major, every discipline in the, is assigned what is called a CIP code. And I talk about that in the, in the article with Ken McAllister. There is a specific CIP code. So if you do Latin American studies, there is a CIP code for that. If you do French, there is a CIP code for that. But there is no CIP code for critical thinking. There is no CIP code for adaptability or for uh, you know, those things. And so, so that's, that's part of the problem too. It's like when you are trying to advocate uh, for those disciplines, they, they don't have a, C, uh, a CIP code, right? And so that's, that's part of the problem we have to continue to work on and to solve, uh, to make people understand and realize that, look, what you are telling me that you need, those employees that you need with those skills, we actually have them. We have them in, and they are in the College of Humanities, they are in the humanities, and that's what they are doing. But we have to be able to transfer that uh, for them to understand it. So I apologize that it was a lot uh, quickly, uh, I hope it was not too confusing, but uh, now is the time where I'll be more than happy to clarify any of the points. Muchas gracias, muito obrigado. Thank, Thank you, you so me. much, esteemed uh, doctor, our esteemed Dean Duran. This was super interesting. Uh, I can just, I don't wanna take up too much time. I definitely wanna open the floor to everybody that's attending for questions. Uh, but I can definitely see the connection and thank you so much for providing the materials that you did. Just looking over how the CEH objectives align with just even the, the snippets of readings, comparing how that dialogue between Brazil and, and Brazil and France was happening so that we know that we're not in a bubble, right? We're not in silos, that's what you talk about. Uh, but now I wanna, I wanna open up the floor for anybody that likes to have a question. I see Rex is first up. Uh, so yeah, this, we're opening up for uh, about 30 minutes of Q&A. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Durant. That was a wonderful presentation, both of them. Um, Thank you. The first presentation was interesting because you talked a little bit about Michel Chevalier's contribution to the naming of Latin America. 
Um, but it's also interesting that you kind of seem to be having a trajectory here about what you're doing with uh, Jorge um, Amado. Amado, Jorge Amado, and then Simone de Beauvoir and uh, Comte and uh, Claude Levi Strauss. Um, and, and a lot of it has to do actually with uh, the, the idea behind naming Latin America, which is racial kinship. The idea of the kinship that uh, Latin America supposedly has with Romance languages. Um, but I'm interested, how does the question of racial kinship play into Brazilian literature in the 20th century? Because when Chevalier talks about it, it actually becomes a justification for the French invasion of Mexico. Yep, that's um, correct. And then, uh, it, but, but then also, it, it, be, it also becomes a justification for uh, you know, uh, cultural genocides and mestizaje yep. and these kinds of things. How does that start to play out in the works of people like Simone de Beauvoir, who, you know, or even, <laughs> even perhaps more controversially with Camus, considering his idea of liberation, but also being very against uh, Algerian liberation in the 1960s. So I'm, I'm interested what your thoughts are on racial kinship how it plays out in the 20th century and where we're starting to see a trajectory of getting away from Michel Chevalier or, for, or towards something else. Thank you so much. Outstanding uh, uh, question. So let me, let me take it uh, and, and you know, I, I can follow up if, if needed. So, all right. So the, the thing is that uh, absolutely right. You have, you have on the one end, you have this, uh, this um, that because of the people like Chevalier and some of these other authors that I have, uh, that I have mentioned, uh, you know, starting with Jean Delery, you have this idea, right, of uh, uh, taking over, like, uh, you know, I think you use the term uh, cultural genocide. Huh? Uh, and that's, uh, that's exactly right. And you, and in fact, you have people in Brazil for a long time, especially in the 19th century, who are kind of follow, following that, not in the sense that they want to annihilate everything, but they think it's the right way to go. So this whole idea about if we want to do real art, let's bring the French to tell us how to do it. Uh, Machado de Assis, who is a very famous uh, uh, Brazilian uh, novelist from the 19th century, you know, uh, well, he's a great, he's a great novelist, but he would say himself, that's what he was trying to do is to follow, you know, those French, uh, uh, French novelist of the 19th century, they uh, Machado de Assis created the Academy of, uh, of the National Academy of Letters uh, in Brazil, which was modeled after the French Academy into like even the, uh, the uniforms that they, uh, that they wear, right? So you definitely have that on the one end. To me, for Brazilian authors specifically, the, the, the novelist that I think, the author, the writer that I think is very important is the one I briefly mentioned is Mario de Andrade and especially that book Makunaima, because, because Andraji, what he's trying to do is exactly this idea to move away from that, to say, you know, we have, uh, so this, uh, this whole idea about the French telling us about Latin America or bringing those, uh, those artists from France, et cetera, et cetera, we don't have to do that. We have our own land, the, the, the land of Brazil here, and Makunaima actually is this idea, it's this uh, guy traveling uh, traveling around, right, and 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 to also reclaim uh, the language. So it's a in Makunaima there is like a, you know, it's it, it's it's a mix of like a, a fiction and reality in some way. You, you are not always sure, you know, if it's part of the fantasy, but it's done on purpose because what what Andrade is trying to do is to create this new venue that will become the 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 Brazilian one, right? And so I so then you have the same thing with. Uh, uh, the authors that you have mentioned, and that's absolutely true. What you said, especially about Camus and uh, uh, Camus and uh, uh, Sartre and Beauvoir, especially with the context of the Algerian War. What's very interesting is that when when Sartre and, and Beauvoir they travel to Brazil, 1959 is when this is going on. You know, it's really great, getting started, getting worse in in with the with Algeria in uh, in France, and so they have uh, people like Sartre and Beauvoir. You know. Uh, they were they were really uh, they were really with the people they were with the Alger in favor of the Algerian uh, people uh, back uh, back in those contexts and with Amado who was a, who was a, a writer really close to the to the people as well in Brazil he had to go to, in exile many times uh, from his own country so he was very close to um, 
uh, to Beauvoir and to uh, and to um, and to Sartre. But there is there is indeed there is like a paradox uh, a paradox because because what you know even though they, those people they thought that way and 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 they depicted things the way they did they don't have any control of the reception of their work and so so you know when when people in France and some of those other writers they would be reading uh, you know those texts about Brazil you know they're gonna they're gonna take what they want from that right and 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 so that's the that's part of the paradox huh? it's that uh, and 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 you know uh, Amado himself in his country you know he, they, you have people to this day that they will not say that Amado was the the best example or the good example uh, to to show when it comes to like a true national uh, you know um, uh, legitimate uh, not affected by european precepts uh, type of of literature right so i hope i uh, that I, that answered your question it's a very good question thank you I, I i would just maybe add please how does that play out in 21st century literature because you talk about like writers yes. nowadays and and you say there's a paradox. Is there is it still like playing out as like a bifurcated kind of literature? So I would say that in unfor well, I I say unfortunately as my own opinion, but in France I think that yeah, it's still it's still like that. I mean, to, in those novels that I've mentioned, a lot of them, you know, they're you know they are interesting, but they are really stereotypical. I think it does you know it does kind of touch on that. Uh, with Brazilian uh, uh, contemporary Brazilian writers, I'm not as knowledgeable on that. You know, I'm not following it as closely, especially since I've been dean. But uh, but what I will say is that there is a, there are some authors for sure in Brazil who want who, who continue to have for objective to change things and to continue going in other direction. And they and there were some before as well. You know, like Guimarães Rosa, for instance. You know, uh, earlier. But uh, but I do I do think that uh, there is still um, there is definitely, you know, for instance, I'll just give that one last example. Uh, I don't know if you have heard about that uh, Brazilian uh, writer named uh, Paulo Coelho. And uh, so, you know, he lives in France and he's very famous, but a lot of Brazilian people, they would say, no way, he's not representative of the, you know, right? So that's one example right there where it's, uh, you know, the, it continues in some ways, right? Uh, but, but we cannot overgeneralize that either. Thank you. Uh, Kaglar, go ahead. Uh, thank you so much for all the information, uh, Dr. Duran, and uh, your wonderful presentation. Uh, actually, I have two basic and very general questions, and I would like to know uh, your opinion about basically the role uh, or influence of French Revolution in Brazil, Brazilian politics, culture, and literature. And could you share any specific work or information about that? And lastly, how is the relationship between two countries, I mean, Brazil and France uh, today in terms of culture and kind of historical connection? And is there any cultural connection between also two countries through French Guiana? Because if someone talks about Latin America, uh, unfortunately, nobody thinks about French Guiana or Guiana or Suriname. Uh, unfortunately, they are invisible countries. And thank you. Thank you. So I'll start with the second one, and then I'm, I may ask you to repeat the first one after that, if that's okay. But let me start with the second one. So the first thing I want to say about this is that, like, uh, you know, the French, they always think, uh, and I'm, I'm comfortable saying that because I'm French, but it's true. I mean, you, you know, the French, they always think like nowadays, even uh, probably they think they have a lot more influence than they actually have, you know, <laughs> so that they kind of see that, you know, like our, our government, for instance, right now, you know, if you were to ask them, they probably see France as like, yeah, it's a major player, uh, you know, when, when in fact, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's, not, quite, uh, it's not quite the case. Uh, so in terms of relations between the between the countries nowadays, they, they are very good. Uh, you know, there are relations. There is a long relation between France and Brazil that continue. Uh, Guyana is one reason to give because people often forget that because of Guyana, we have a common border with Brazil, and there are issues that come up with that. Like for instance, you know, one of the one of the big issues that the French and the Brazilian they have to work on together is the smuggling. Uh, of the and the traffic that are going on, especially with um, uh, what do you call that? Um, Quicksilver. 
that's it. Quicksilver uh, between the two uh, the two areas. So there are there are a lot with that. Uh, but but uh, you know you have a lot of people uh, from Brazil or originally from Brazil who live and work in France and the same way around with a lot of French people uh, in Brazil. A lot of students, for instance, um, there are many many graduate students from Brazil who study in France uh, to to this day. Uh, more than French who study in Brazil, but there are some also who study in Brazil. So because of that, you know, there, there are some uh, relation culturally in terms of of culture. There are, there are definitely uh, some connections. Like, for instance, there is this, uh, uh, I don't know if she's as active anymore, but there is this singer, Bia, from Brazil, that uh, will produce some songs in both. Uh, so she will take like uh, famous French songs and adapt them in Brazilian, and or like Brazilian songs to adapt in French. And that's one example. There are a lot, there, there are a lot of exchanges like that, or Chico Buarque de Holanda. He, he, you know, just like Jorge Amado, he lived in France too, in exile for many years. You know, Gilberto Gil. I mean, here is another example I can give you of that. That's a good way to to see that. It's like uh, you know, three years ago or two. I think it was about three years ago, maybe a little bit more now. But uh, Gaetano Veloso and and uh, Gilberto Gil were two of the most famous Brazilian musicians in history. They did, uh, and they they are pretty old now. Uh, but they came to do a tour uh, in France. Uh, it was not just France, it was in Europe, but they had several dates in France. And it was only them and the guitar. There was no like a band, you know, it's just the two of them. And, you know, it was packed. It's like you have people, you know, whereas uh, I'm not sure that, uh, uh, you know, it would be the case uh, everywhere. So there are still, there are still these connections, but in terms of like business, you know, uh, economy, uh, uh, industrial exchanges. I mean, the countries that are that are really playing a bigger role now in Brazil is not France. It's uh, China, uh, the, the United States, uh, and, and you know, France is still a, a player there, uh, but it's not. Um, it's definitely not like a major, uh, uh, you know, a major competitor. Uh, and in terms of literature, I I would say that um, you know, unfortunately, like I was saying earlier, and again, unfortunately, in my opinion. Is that uh, the, the the you know the ones that that are famous now in France or that are read? They might not be like the you know the best uh, the best writers, but uh, but they are. Um, one thing I noticed though that is different from before for sure is that when you go to a bookstore in Brazil, I I, I love to go to bookstores anywhere I am, but but in Brazil uh, I often go there and. You know, you will, one thing you will notice if you go to the foreign literature section, I always like to do that. And you find very few, if any, uh, works in uh, French work in translation. You know, or if you do, it's going to be, you know, Balzac or Alexandre Dumas, you know, whereas uh, you look at the US section and it's like, you know, like, uh, so that, that tells you too that, uh, you know, uh, it's, it's no, it, even like 20 years ago, it was probably a lot, uh, you know, maybe there was not more French people, more French works than American, but they were a lot more than, than they are now. And you see that too in the studying of the language. That's another good example. So I work with a lot of Brazilian universities. I have students there. And one thing that to this day impressed me about Brazil is that they have actually a lot of people there who continue to study French. So more even than the United States. Like I work a lot with the Alliance Française. Alliance Française is a network that is present all over the world and they teach like French cultural classes or French language classes. And uh, you know, there is one in Tucson. I mean, no offense, I hope nobody is in the audience is from the Alliance Française, but you know, they have very few students. You know, it's very difficult. I mean, you go to the one in Brazil, it's like, it's huge, you know? But then if you compare that to the number of people who learn English, that's like nothing. It's like, you know, you have a lot more people now who study English uh, instead of French. And that's also where you see that, the, the change, you know, in, in the progression. Uh, sorry, so what, can you please say again the, the, the French Revolution question? Sorry, Oromi, uh, because I need to answer that. Uh, professor, basically, I mean, the influence or role of French Revolution in Brazilian uh, culture, politics, and literature. Do you know any uh, specific, you know, work or information about that or your thoughts? 
Yeah, Thank so you. that that I'm not. I I I have to admit I am not uh, as knowledgeable. The only thing I would say is that uh, I mean, like I said in the presentation, uh, the French theories of the you know early uh, 19th century at least they, they had a big influence on on Brazil. And Auguste Comte is the man, uh, the most important one. Now you know that's not exactly uh, only connected to the French uh, the French Revolution. That said. What's interesting about uh, about Brazil, it's like, you know, it, it's the only country, as far as I know, correct me if I'm wrong, but it's the only country in Latin America that, that at some point has had a monarchy, right? And, and, uh, um, and in fact, uh, uh, you know, the, because, you know, the, the, it was the son of the, if I remember correctly, it was the son of the emperor uh, of Portugal who came into, uh, you know, they had to come to exile to Brazil when Napoleon uh, came to Portugal, right? And then eventually the father went back, but the son stayed as the, and became the emperor of Brazil. Uh, but then after that, uh, you know, eventually Brazil became, uh, you know, an independent, uh, uh, you know, I mean, I mean sorry. Uh, so he became an independent country started by the son and then eventually became a republic after that. But um, so that's, that's what, that, yeah, Don Pedro, thank you. Uh, Romy, go ahead. Ah, okay. Hello. <laughs> Hello. Thank you for your presentation and thank you, Dr. Aria for Dr. Arias for stay here and uh, Monica Morales <laughs> um, uh, are nuestros colegas <laughs> por estar aquí. And um, my question is about the um, the future of the literature in the humanities. Uh, I was I was reading a, uh, I was reading your article uh, about the humanities. So. I was thinking um, the I was thinking about the difference between the literat literatura um, and the cultural studies. So what do you think about this um, the difference between the literature with and gender and, and the um, cultural studies and another subgenre about the literature? So what do you think about the future of the literature in the, in the academy? Mm, very good question, thank you. Well, I think it's a central question because I think that, um, you know, the same way that there is this, uh, you know, what I was saying about uh, humanities having to always justify itself on the, on the national platform as compared to other uh, fields like uh, you know business engineering medicine or law for instance i think that within the humanities maybe literature is the one that that always also have to uh, defend itself right because with literature there is this idea that i don't know that's just me but but i have some of my friends saying that you know like uh, so i'll give you an, a personal example when i went to college i did my uh, i did my internship uh for my, uh, the summer of my junior year, I did, because I was a, I was a, a business administration major and, and Spanish and French major, I was a double major. And so for my business internship, I, I worked for the marketing department of a soft drink company in France named, uh, called Orangina. I don't know if you know that, it's like a soft drink from France, it's called Orangina. It's a very famous soft drink in France. And uh, so at the end, uh, the year after that, after my internship, when I graduated, they offered me a job, you know? And uh, I thought my parents, they were going to kill me and my friends because I, uh, I, I didn't take the job. And instead I told them, uh, instead I would go to graduate school uh, to study literature. <laughs> and that's, you know, my friends, my friends, uh, they say, uh, they, they said, uh, yeah, well, stop with your, uh, stop with your Jean-Paul Sartre act, you know, uh, you know, that kind of like a, to make a joke, right, of Jean-Paul Sartre. And so then I told them, I said, no, actually, I'm, I'm more of a Camus fan. <laughs> but, but, you know, there was, there was this idea, this notion that if you're going to do literature, you know, why, why would you do that? You're going to ruin your life, you know? And, and, and I think that, unfortunately, uh, uh, it, it kind of go back to some of the things I was saying earlier. I think that there is still some of that, and, and it's up to us. Uh, the, the only way we can manage maybe to change that is by, by taking over the narrative uh, and taking over the narrative in explaining over and over again, you know, 
why, why, you know, what literature is and why it's so important. Because again, if you tell somebody, here, I've got the plan for you, get your master uh, or the bachelor in, in French literature, Spanish literature and or Latin American literature and you're all set, right? They're gonna go, are you crazy? They're gonna be like my friends. I say, what the heck, you know? So instead what we have to do, and it's too bad that we have to do that. We should not have to do that. But, but what we have to do is we have to say, you know, if you study literature, that's what you're gonna be learning. And that's why it's so important, right? And, and you go back to the example I was giving. If I tell somebody, uh, I, yeah, you should hire me because uh, I was a Latin American literature major, you know, they, they, that's not gonna work most likely. But if you say, you should hire me because I just got a degree in Latin American literature and uh, I can really communicate well. I can work with, I'm a team player. I can work with anybody. I, I know about adaptability, Excel. all the skills again that I was telling you about. And if you do the research, I have that in the article. I mean, the, the, the employers, that's what they want, right? So that, that's for students graduating. But for those of us and those of you who are going to be the, the new professors of the future uh, in academia, you know, this is something that, you, that you're gonna to have to deal with as well. Like when you talk to your students and when you advise your, your students, you know, it's, it's something very important because what, what we see with our students too often, unfortunately, and, and either undergraduate or graduate, and, and I am okay saying that because I was like that myself, is that often, you know, you will, you will think like, you know, you, it would be fast to think, yeah, I could never do that or like, you know, I don't know, I don't know what to say about that, or, you know, and so that's why it's very important it, as professors, you know, we are the one who have to mentor our students and to tell them those things and to guide them toward that. So that when they go out there and if you are, you, your student is going to go for a job or they go to apply for graduate school, whatever it is, that you can give them those concepts, that it's not just you give them the degree, but you explain and we keep explaining why those things they are they are important and and what they get they get from from, from them thank you you're welcome yes uh, alma Yes, so, so uh, I have kind of a question that kind of goes hand in hand with, with Romy's question. Uh, when us students have been that, that uh, study uh, Spanish and Spanish literature at the UA, we study a, a lot of it through a theoretical lens, which mm. is super enriching because it does, it, you learn about how to perceive the world around you. And we try to, I mean, it does tie in with literature, but there's also been a debate. And I think, uh, I, mean, I like where Romy was going with her question about how much of of literature is turning into cultural study and the markability of that. Where do you see the future of that? Gotcha. Now, yes, thank you for uh, following up on that because now I, I see where you are going with that. Yeah, so that's a very good question as well. We had, uh, so those debates, they already existed a while back when I was a student, you know, when I, especially being from France because uh, there was the whole thing about the whole French theory, you know, back in those, uh, I mean, it's still the case, but especially, you know, uh, I went to graduate school in the mid 1990s. So it was definitely uh, you know, a big deal, uh, Derrida and Baudrillard and Bourdieu and all of that. So, uh, and you know, there will be this debate. We will have those debates with my, uh, with my classmates about uh, you know, should, the, should the theory be a tool to help me analyze literature or, or, or should the theory itself be, you know, is the, liter the, the, the literature in itself, right? Which is a fascinating, uh, fascinating debate, all right? I mean, I am of the, so, you know, I, I don't have the absolute answer of that. I'll just give you my opinion and what I think. I am of the opinion that uh, all of those things are important. I think that what, what is important is that we still have a model uh, that will allow for those reflections to happen and develop. And if they go in the direction uh, where it's, uh, you know, theoretical theoretical texts uh, that are of, uh, of interest and that uh, are being studied, fine. As long as it's not, uh, you know, a, a same thing for the, the purely fictional, just liter uh, you know, fictional literature uh, text. As long as, you know, it, 
what I don't like and what I'm not in favor of is that there will be one, you know, one instead of the other, or like one has to replace the other. I think that uh, the humanities, again, you know, it's about interdisciplinary and, and literature is literature, you know, that then you can break it down. It's like fictional, non-fictional, you know, wh whatever. But, but regardless, if you read a, a text by Derrida or if you read the text by Jorge Amado, they both text are literature, you know, then, you know, it's a different type of text, no question. But uh, so I, I don't think that, uh, I think it would be a shame, you know, and same thing for languages in general, you know, uh, people say, well, what is really in France, for instance, and Brazil is like that too. People say, well, what is really needed today is English. We need to have people learn English, no question. But if, if it becomes like the, all they're going to learn from in the future will be only English, I, I don't think it's a good thing. I think we have to, and it's the same for those, for those questions having to do with, uh, you know, theory, literature, uh, fictional literature. We, ne we need to have all of it. We, we need it all. We need, we need to think more in terms of like, you know, innovation, creativity, where is that taking me? And, and if, and if the, the medium that's gonna take me there for, to, for more ide my ideas to be listened to and presented, is through this way, then I should be able to do that. And if it's through this way, I should be able to do that. But I don't, I am not in favor of saying, look, I know which medium is the best one for your ideas to go through. And believe me, that's what you should be doing, right? So, I mean, I, I, I strongly believe myself in the power of literature or pure fiction literature. Uh, you know, there is this famous uh, text by uh, Jorge Sempron, uh, in Spanish, we live in France, it's called Literature or Life, you know, and he spent he spend time in the concentration camps. And that's a good, you know, there is this debate about uh, when you look at the uh, literature about the Holocaust, for instance, and you have similar themes uh, about the literature uh, of, of trauma in general, or like 9-11 is another one that I've studied a little bit. And you always have that question that will come up. Uh, where, you know, people will say, for instance, Sempron, he believes that fiction literature is the most powerful way to make sure that we're going to keep continuing writing about the Holocaust so that people will remember. And his theory is to say that it's such an awful thing that to give it justice and to really describe it and to give the, there is no way you can, you know, you can, uh, uh, you can do it through nonfiction or through uh, you, you have to use literature. But then you have people like Claude Lanzmann, he said the opposite. Claude Lanzmann is the, the film director of the, film, the famous film Shoah. You know, he, he, has, he has said that you cannot, you know, for, to describe the, the gas chambers, uh, you know, in Auschwitz, the only people who could really do it are the people who were there to report it and they are not there to, you know, and you can, we should not be doing that through uh, art or through literature or through fiction, because it's impossible, right? And people like Sam Prun, they say, no, actually, that's true fiction that you're going to be able to, uh, to do that. Uh, and so that's, uh, that's, uh, you know, that's the debate. Uh, but to me, what's important is that we have the most of these ways uh, of expressing ourselves still. And, and so that which one worked the best is up to us after that. Uh, yes, Rex. And, well, this is interesting because this debate is also playing against a backdrop of things going on here in the United States, for instance, the Tennessee School Board that recently banned uh, a comic book man. version of of what happened in the Holocaust. That's right. So, like, we have to we have to take this into account. With like, there are people who are willing to just shut down all conversation at all, and then we won't be able to have this debate about whether or not fiction or nonfiction works. So, how do we address that? That's right. That's right. Exactly. That's a very good example. Uh, and that, so, you know, I, 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 okay, now, I, so when he makes me think about something else, but when I, uh, so when I, uh, before I came to Arizona, I was uh, for a few years at the University of Rhode Island on the East Coast, and, and uh, I had done a course there on the 9-11, uh, uh, 9-11 literature. And so we were uh, reading various uh, works uh, of literature associated with that. Uh, both nonfiction and fiction. And, and one thing that was fascinating, I've taught that class a few times and it will always come up in the discussion. And to me, that was fascinating because one of the novels we were studying, 
so they went the, there was the Art Spiegelman in the Shadow of No Towers. That's another book he did. And then we had one by a French novelist called Frédéric Begbede, which is called uh, Windows on the World, which was the name of the restaurant that was uh, at the top of one of the two towers, right? And uh, Begbede is a French writer, and he kind of he, he kind of count a story that he invented, you know, but it's based on the imagine, you know, those people that are trapped there and blah, blah, blah. But every time we would have the debate in the class, it was a graduate class, there were always students that would say, well, you know, I cannot, I cannot understand what the, why that Beck Bede was even allowed to publish that book. And people would say, well, why? He said, well, because he's, he's not from there. He's not a New Yorker. He was not there. He, did, he cannot know what happened. And, and so other people will always say, well, you know, why would he have to do that? Why would he, you know, he's a, he's a novelist. I mean, he didn't, he's not claiming in, this, in his work or in interviews that, you know, he, he has the absolute truth or whatever. He just decided that he was going to write on that. And, 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 but you know, it was like really a strong debate and there were people who go as far as saying, which is equivalent in some, I mean, of course those, it's not exactly equivalent, but at least in the way of thinking when Lance, Lance Mann, you know, he said uh, the, the gas chamber, it, it cannot be dealt with, with art or with uh, fiction. You know, that was similar is to say only people who were there uh, would be able to depict it. Uh, and, and so that's kind of go back to this idea like, Unless you do it this certain way, you are eliminated from the debate. You know, you cannot even participate, right? And it's almost like it would be even disrespectful to do that, right? And so that's that's really interesting because because he, he will come every time I did the class, he will come. You know, it was because sometimes you could say, well, you know, that was just like the, the dynamic that one time, that person background, whatever experience. But like every single time there will be that topic. In fact, I ended up organizing my course where I would know there was going to be that, you know, to have the, it was a fascinating uh, discussion, but it, it can be, I agree with you that it can be, uh, and that's what I'm against. I hope we never get to that where it's, that's what will happen. It's like, then it will only be like one authoritative uh, uh, thing that is approved and why, why? No, it should not be like that. Thank you so much team and everybody that, that's present. We do have time for one more question. Does anybody have, one last burning desire to ask our esteemed dean one last question. I actually when, have. When, yeah, no, go ahead, go ahead. If you have a question, go ahead. I had a kind of a simple question. It's probably a little bit basic, but I was curious uh, when you mentioned that there was certain things, certain. Um, certain things that really appeal to the, a French audience when we're talking about the, the Brazilian French connection, especially early on. And uh, we usually it's, it's when people when when the I was curious what those were and why you thought those certain um, archetypes were so popular or that, or that fetishizing was so popular or exoticizing so popular in France. What is it about those cultural markers that you mentioned that appeal to the French audience? Yeah, so I think that it's not necessarily only to the French audience, most likely, but it's true that people are usually uh, uh, always interested, the general public, you know, in, uh, uh, you know, if you have like some kind of like love stories or love interest, and it, it's about like, you know, uh, uh, a festive, uh, you know, like, like Brazil always have this kind of image of the carnaval, right? So if you are somebody who has never been, like, I bet if you were to ask people in France, you know, uh, who have never been to Brazil, you know, and you are to ask them, when I, if I tell you Brazil, what is, what are some things that come to mind? You know, I can bet you the carnaval is going to be in there, right? So that's, you know, and, and that, that doesn't necessarily mean that those people are passionate about carnaval because we have carnaval in France too, right? But it's, it's kind of, it, or soccer, soccer will be another one, right? Now, soccer is, is a little different because, you know, France is, is it's a big country about soccer too. So we have that thing in common with them. But, but uh, so I think it, it has to do with that. Now, historically, there is another reason that I touch on a little bit in the article that I, I have sent you. And that's just my own, one of my theory, there are other people who agree. But one of the reasons, in my opinion, why uh, Jorge Amado especially became so big in France uh, in the late uh, 60s and early 70s, it's because it's a period in France where there were all these experimentation with literature, you know, the, if you're familiar with the new novel, the nouveau roman, or the avant-garde theater, and 
you know, it's uh, it's not that easy to. I mean, if you are if you are not like in a professor of literature it, for the general public, it's not that easy to read. You know, it's like it was experimentation where, like for instance, uh, the, the the characters they have no names, or instead of having a big you you have the beginning at the end and the end at the beginning. You know, they were trying to really break the codes of the novel. Uh, one one area, by the way, that is interesting if you get a chance. I like that is the Ulipo. In the Ulipo movement, what they do is they give themselves some challenges. So, for instance, uh, the, the most famous author of the Ulipo was Georges Perec, and he wrote that book called La Disparition, La Disparition, and and it's it's a fairly long book, and the challenge was that there is not a single word in that book that used the voyeur, the voyeur e, which is the most used letter in in French language. Okay. So they will they will give themselves some challenges like that. So we are like that, but the general public, you know, they don't, you know, they want to read stuff that are, you know, for fun or whatever. And and Jorge Amado, he was an alternative to that, you know, when he was there, uh, because because in French in France there was really that movement. A lot of people were trying to do that stuff of the experimentation, and and so you had all audience, you know, that they don't necessarily like that, and they found the refuge in, you know, it's the evasion too, like people who. They ne you most likely they'll never get to go to Latin America in their life, but it's a way to kind of travel uh, to the uh, to the literature. Thank you, Monica. Well, again, our, we extend our, our warmest thank you to you, Dean, for, for hosting this. It was super interesting. And I think what we exemplified that fraternity that, that you mentioned between Camus and Amato and, and this in what we're doing here. Uh, so thank you too to the working group for being here, Romy and, and, and Brex and everybody that's connected. Uh, so I hope that everybody has a great rest of, of, of their day. Thank you so much. Yes, thank you very much. And thank you for having me. And I'm very impressed by your group. I think it's a great idea to have that. And, you know, let me tell you, um, this is something that uh, is very valuable now as graduate students, as, as you are saying, to have this community. But it is something you love forever. You may, you, you know, you you'll understand later. But like me to this day, I remember back when I was in graduate school that we would have group like that and people that I'm still in touch with, you know, and it, it's fantastic. And and it's really like some of your professors may have told you this, and it's the truth. It's like and you know, even though it's not that easy, and there are some times where you know we feel a little depressed, maybe. But these are some of the best years where you know I wish. I wish I was back sometime in graduate school so that I would have so much time just to read even, you know? And, and I'm not saying that, uh, you know, you have extra time. I know you are very busy and everything, but take advantage of that because uh, those are really intensive, great years that uh, I, I have great memories to this day. So I know it will be the same for all of you. So thank you again. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.